What's going on everybody? Thanks for tuning back in. Today, we're going to be taking a look at how to construct a RESTful API with CRUD functionality in depth. I'm going to be specifically looking at Mongoose and MongoDB as my database of choice. And as always, I'll be making this project using nothing but TypeScript. Now, that being said, I'm gonna show you a couple extra things in this video as compared to the last video I did on Mongo, where I only showed you the read functionality of reading into a database with Mongoose. I'm gonna show you full CRUD functionality, which stands for create, read, update, and delete. I'm gonna make you a small custom logger. I'm actually gonna show you how to build the build as well. The only thing I'm not gonna cover is tests. So this is going to be a lot more in depth than the previous video that I made to help people who are struggling with other functions that are CRUD that aren't read. And for those of you using Visual Studio Code, I have a special treat for you where I'm gonna show you how to use Visual Studio Code snippets to make life way easier when it comes to creating more than one controller or routes file, for example. I'm gonna make it so that we can easily take our code and replicate it over and over again. Okay guys, let's get into it. So let's open up a terminal in the folder that we wanna create our project in, and let's install a few things. I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see this a little bit better. Go ahead and run an npm install dash g for global and install the following packages nodemon, ts node, prettier, and typescript. I'm installing these globally so I can use them for all my projects. Next, we're going to run an npm init and enter all of your information for your package here. I'm going to use the defaults for now, but edit my package.json when I open up my project in Visual Studio Code. Speaking of which, go ahead and do that once you have finished your npm init. You can see my very basic package.json here, so it's time to start editing. First, I'm going to run an npm install. I'm going to install chalk at 4.1.2, a specific version. I'm going to install .env, express, joy, and mongoose. Chalk is a library for adding color to the console. This is just to show you how to make a custom logger if you don't want to use a downloaded library. .env helps us load our environment variables. Express is for building our RESTful API framework. Joy is for data validation. And Mongoose is to access MongoDB with a nice little wrapper. A lot of these packages have TypeScript definitions with them, so we only have to install TypeScript dependencies for a couple of our packages. Go ahead and run an npm install dash dash save dev, and we're going to do TypeScript, and then we're going to do the types for Express. Now that we've done that, take a look at your JSON file and you're gonna see all of our dependencies installed. Next, we're gonna define some scripts. Let's go ahead and define our start script. This one is going to be very simple. Basically, we're just gonna be calling node and then our build forward slash server.js file. What this is going to do is basically run node against our actual build once we compile our TypeScript into JavaScript. Next, for the build script, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have an rm-rf and get rid of the build folder. We're going to add two ampersands and then call TSC, which is our TypeScript compiler. Next, go ahead and run a TSC dash dash init. So it's going to load up a TypeScript.json file for you that defines how your project is going to use TypeScript. I'm going to copy and paste my file in here without the comments. Everything in here is the same as the default tsconfig.json. The only thing I've added is my out directory, which is period forward slash build and my include section, which is basically telling TypeScript that I only want to compile my source files. Next, for those of you using Visual Studio Code, I have three plugins installed that I'm going to be using that you should use as well. .env is going to add support for .env files just to make the linting a little bit prettier. Speaking of which, prettier is installed, which is going to be my code formatter for my TypeScript. It's going to make everything have even spacing, uh, all the commas where they're supposed to be, quotes, semicolons, etc. And then finally, the third one is optional, but Visual Studio Code icons makes the icons inside of my Explorer look a lot nicer and a lot more organized. Back inside of our project, inside of the root directory, I'm going to make a folder called .vscode, and inside of it, I'm going to make a settings.json. As I do with most of my projects, I'm going to paste in here some basic Visual Studio Code settings that I like to use. Basically, the default formatter that you can see here is that prettier plugin that I just installed. So I want to make sure that I have in here and I want to have that format on save and format on paste. Those are the most important. So anytime you paste code or save it, it's just going to format that file for you. Next, inside of my root directory, again, I'm going to add a .prettierrc and I'm going to paste in my prettier rules. Again, these are the rules that I like to use. 
You can use whatever rules you want, but these are the ones that I like to go with. Next, go ahead and create the source folder that we referenced inside of our tsconfig.json. And we're gonna create a bunch of folders on the inside and get our folder structure underway as well. So the folders I'm gonna want you to create inside of your source folder are config, controllers, library, middleware, models, and routes. This is the basic setup of a lot of my projects. We're gonna tackle this project by first setting up some config, then we're gonna connect to Mongo, then we're gonna create our API rules, create some routes, and then we're gonna protect our data. So inside of the config folder, go ahead and create a file called config.ts. At the top, we're gonna to import .env from .env, and then we're gonna take that .env and call .config as a function. What this is going to do is going to load any environment variables we happen to have inside of our bash RC or inside of our current environment or inside of a .env file in our root directory of our project. The reason that we wanna use environment variables is because you don't wanna store things like passwords inside of code. You want them to be usually environment specific or hidden away environment variables when nobody can see them. So before I create any of my variables, I need to set up a MongoDB. If you have this already done, you can go ahead and skip this step. But if you haven't set one up, I'm gonna show you how to set one up for free. Hop on over to google.com and search for Mongo Atlas. You can go ahead and click the sign up with Google, and then it's going to ask you to log in. So once you've done that, go to the next step. Go ahead and accept the privacy policy and hit submit and then follow the steps to get set up with MongoDB Atlas. It's gonna ask you some basic questions, you just gotta fill them out. Once you get to the tier section, on the right hand side, you should see the free tier eligible one. And then it's gonna ask you where you wanna create a shared cluster. You're gonna go ahead and fill out the information. I'm gonna pick AWS. And then you can go ahead and click create cluster. Then it's gonna ask you to create a username and password. This is what you're gonna to use to log into your database. Go ahead and create a username and then you can make your own password or you can generate one. Just make sure you copy and paste it because we're going to need it for later. Now that you've created your user, don't forget to whitelist your current IP address. So this is an IP address I'm using from a VPN. I'm actually going to add another subset of this and I'm going to change the 75 to a zero and do a slash 24, which basically covers the entire IP range. And the reason that I'm doing this is that last number on my IP whenever I connect never stays the same. Once you've done that, you can hit finish and close, and then it should start creating your cluster for you. Now, you're gonna see your cluster deploying. It's gonna take a little while, so what we can do, we can actually go back to our project and fill out some variables. So we're gonna make a couple constants. I'm gonna make a Mongo username, and that's gonna be equal to my process.env.mongo underscore username, or an empty string. And the reason I put the or empty string at the end is so TypeScript understands that this variable is a string and not null. I'm gonna do the same thing with a password. And then I'm gonna create a Mongo URL and I'm gonna leave this blank for now because I'm gonna fill this in once my cluster is created. I'm gonna do one more and that's a server port, but instead of making it like the previous two, I'm gonna to check to see that it exists with my question mark. If it does, I want a number from that port because I'm gonna make everything a string inside of my environment variables or a default port number, and I'm just gonna obviously pick one through three, seven, because what other number would you pick? Go ahead and export a const config. You can do something like add the username and password if you want, but in reality, all we really need is the URL. So export the Mongo URL and create a server section and export the server port as well. By the time you've done all this, your database should be done deploying. So go ahead and click the connect button inside of your cluster. And then you're gonna to wanna to connect with your application and it's gonna give you the string that we need. Copy that string, paste it into your Mongo URL and replace the super user and password sections with the Mongo username and Mongo password that you created. Next, let's go ahead and create our server.ts file. This is gonna go right inside the source folder outside of all the other folders that we made. We're gonna import three libraries for now. We're gonna import Express from Express, HTTP from HTTP, and Mongoose from Mongoose. Once you've done your three imports, go ahead and create a constant router and make that equal to Express as a function. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to wanna to connect to Mongoose because if we don't connect to Mongoose, we don't wanna do anything else inside of our project. 
So how we're going to do this is we're going to type mongoose.connect and then we're going to pass in our config.mongo.url. Make sure that you've imported config so that it auto completes for you. And then you're going to add a then and a catch block. Now the string that Mongo Atlas generated for us actually had some options in it. So I'm going to show you another way to pass those options in. Go back to your config and get rid of that majority and rewrites. We're going to actually pass those in as actual parameters. So you can go ahead and just get rid of those and then go back to your server.ts file. And after you call config.mongo.url, put a comma and then pass in an object. And this is where you pass in your options. And you can basically just pass in those same two options, W being majority and rewrites being true. Once you've done that, inside of the then block, you can go ahead and log something like console connected. And inside of the catch block, you can log a console error. Before I do anything else, I'm going to go back to my package.json and my main, I'm going to change to source slash server.ts. And the reason that I'm doing this is so I can just type in nodemon and it will automatically pick up the main file that I want to proxy. Now, when I click nodemon, you can see that there is an issue and that's the actual username and password don't exist. And that's because I haven't declared my environment variables yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a .env file, a .env, and that's going to go inside of our root directory. Here you can create your Mongo username and your Mongo password and paste in the password that you created before. I'm also going to add my server port to show you how it can change. And I'm going to change this to something like 9090. You can make it any number under about 65,000. Now, when I run nodemon again, you're going to see that it takes a second and then it says connected, which means that it's successfully connecting to Mongo Atlas. So the next thing I'm going to do is create a custom logging component. Instead of using the console log, I'm just going to create my own little logging library instead of using something like log4js or Morgan or whatever people use. So I'm going to create a logging.ts file inside of my library. At the top, I'm going to import chalk from chalk. I'm going to export a default class logging, and then I'm going to create some static logging functions to keep it nice and simple. I'm going to create a public static info. It's going to take args as any, because I want to log anything really. And that's just going to point to a console.log, but inside of it, I'm going to do a couple things. First, I'm going to call chalk.blue, and then I'm going to pass in a string that is actually the current date to a locale string. And the reason that I'm doing this is because I want every log to have the current date time on it. Then right after that, I'm going to add the info just to declare that this is an info log statement. Next, I'm going to check to see what our type of args is after the comma. If it is a type string, I want to chalk bright blue the args. If not, I just want to display the args. And the reason that I'm typing it this way is because if it's a string, chalk can color it. But if it's not a string, it's going to show up as object object. You won't actually see what it is. So to see what it is fully, you just want to log the actual args themselves. I'm going to copy and paste this two more times, create a warn and an error function and change the blue to either yellow or red, depending if it's warning or error. And once you've done this, you can even make a public static log function. And it also takes args and just points to the info function, kind of like what the console.log does sometimes, depending on your logging library. Now inside of my server.ts, I'm going to change my console logs to my logging.info. It's going to import automatically for me with Visual Studio Code. And once I've done that, then I'm going to just change these little logging statements and then run my project with nodemon one more time. And then you can see that it displays the date, the log level, and the color as all correct depending on the log that has been passed. So now that we've got our basic config set up and our mongoose connecting, the next step is to actually create our RESTful API and its rules. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new function. It's gonna be called start server. And the reason I'm not just declaring all of my router functions right here, but I'm rather putting them inside of a function is because if mongoose doesn't connect, I don't wanna call any of this stuff. I just want the program to exit just in case I'm running this in a script or a Docker container or something, I want it to just safely exit. So what I'm going to do is create this function and then put everything inside of it. Once you've named your function, call it from the then block inside of your mongoose.connect. And then let's start actually implementing our router functionality. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add the logging to our router. So we're going to log the request and the response. Call router.use to create a piece of middleware. 
Inside of it, you're gonna have a function that has request, response, and next as props. And inside of the function, the first thing we're gonna do is log the request. So how we're gonna do that is we're going to call our logging.info. I'm gonna say incoming because this is the beginning of the request. I'm gonna first check the method and how I'm gonna do that is check the req.method or request.method. I'm also gonna check the URL. I wanna see where this request is going. So for example, whatever the API endpoint is, for example, forward slash books slash get. Then I'm gonna get the IP of whoever is calling this or whoever's passing in the request. So this could be your local host, this could be a function, this could be a browser, but whatever it is, it should give me some sort of IP address. And now that I've logged the request, I'm gonna check my response.on finish listener. So once this specific request is finished, I wanna actually copy and paste what I had up before and add the status code so I can check to see what happened with the request, did it pass or not. So type in status, and then the variable you're gonna to wanna to check in here is actually res.statuscode to get my response.status code. Nice and simple. After the response finish, go ahead and call the next functionality. What this will do is allow us to pass through this piece of middleware instead of ending the request on this middleware. Anytime you want middleware to actually pass the request through, you have to have the next function on it. Some basic housekeeping that we have to do is call our router.use and then express.url encoded extended to true and then express.json. So this is basically some settings that I only want to get JSON requests and I don't care if they're nested. Nice and simple stuff. This used to be separated by body parser, but it's included inside of Express now, which is really nice. To save some time, I'm gonna copy in the rules of our API. I use these in all my projects, but I'm going to explain them to you. So the first header, access control, allow origin. The star just says that these requests can come from anywhere. You can put in a list of IPs here or trusted sources if you want this to be super private. And then the header following that just tells us what headers we're allowed to use inside of our project. And then finally, if we pass in an options request, it's just gonna return all of the options we can use inside of this API. After that, of course, we're gonna call the next function one more time to go through this, just to make sure that we pass through our request. So the next section that would come is our actual routes, but we haven't declared those yet, so we can skip this section for now. Next, I'm gonna actually add a get request here, and it's gonna be called a health check. It's just a route I can call to make sure my API is working properly. So I'm gonna call router.get, I'm gonna give it the address of forward slash ping. I'm going to put in the standard request response next middleware provided by Express. And all this is gonna do is return a response.status of 200 and a JSON message that can say anything you want. I call the endpoint ping, so it's just gonna return pong. Nice and simple. Lastly, after that, we're gonna have some basic error handling. Basically what this is going to say is that if our request passes through all the routes and doesn't match anything, we're gonna go ahead and throw an error saying that this is not an actual route or we're gonna call the error not found. As you can see here, we're gonna call logging.error and actually log that error. And then we'll return a response status of 404 and pass the message. Now that we've declared all that, go ahead and call your HTTP.createServer pass in your router, and then call the dot listen, pass in your config.server port, and then add a callback function that basically just logs saying that the server is successfully running on port, and then you can pass in the variable one more time if you want. You can have any message here that you desire. Once this message is called, you know that the server is running. I'm gonna go ahead and call NodeMon one more time. Start up my project, you can see that we're connected to Mongo and the server is running on port 9090, which means that my environment variables are being picked up. I'm gonna grab the Postman utility, which allows me to call API requests. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass in my localhost 9090 and I'm just gonna call ping. And you can see it returned the message pong. If you take a look at the console log, you can see the incoming method and then the outgoing method, which I forgot to rename, but we can do that later in the code. Now, if I type in a route that doesn't exist, you can see that the message is gonna say not found. And then you're gonna see that this error shows up in the console and it actually prints red as we have declared it. Now, since the error itself isn't a string, you can see that it doesn't highlight just the way we wanted the functionality to work. Now that we have a basic server running, it's time to have some fun with Mongo. 
I'm going to be using the classic example of authors and books as my model. I'm going to have a schema for my authors and for my books, and I'm going to link them together as an author writes a book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the models, controllers, and routes next. And first, I'm going to create the author, model, controller, and route. Then I'm going to show you how to use Visual Studio Code snippets to automatically create as many of these as you want with very, very simple variable management. And what I mean by that is I'm just gonna have some placeholders and we just have to replace certain variables and then we can populate any controller or route file that we want. So inside of the models folder, go ahead and create your author.ts file. At the top, we're gonna import Mongoose and then inside of some brackets, we're gonna import the document and schema from Mongoose as well. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna export an interface and I'm gonna call it iAuthor. This interface is just going to have a name that's a string because that's the only information we want for our author. Now, after this, I'm going to declare another interface called my iAuthor model, and it's going to extend the iAuthor and the document that I imported before. And that's because the document provides all of the underscore ID, the timestamps, everything else that we would need inside of a Mongo model. The reason that I'm not just declaring the iAuthor as an extended document is because I want to use the iAuthor as my base for some simple validation. So I wanna keep this separate for now. You'll see what I mean when we start protecting our routes. After this, go ahead and create a author schema, which is going to be a type schema, make that equal to a new schema. And inside of it, we're gonna pass in a couple objects. The first one is going to have the uh, name key and it's going to be declared with the type that's a string with a capital S. And it's going to have a required as true, which means that this has to be input in order for us to put in our model. Put a comma after this object, and then inside here, we're gonna say version key is equal to false. This just means I don't wanna return the version key variable, something that is provided by Mongo. Next, we're gonna export a default mongoose.model, and inside of the chevrons, we're gonna pass in our iAuthor model. Then inside of the function, it's gonna take two things. It's gonna take a string. We're gonna call this author, which is gonna be the name of our document collection, and then the author schema. And now our model is complete. Next, we wanna to go to our controllers folder and create our author controller. So how we're gonna do that is at the top, we're gonna import the next function, request and response from express. We're gonna import mongoose from mongoose, and then we're gonna import author from our model's author. Create a new function called const create author, pass in the request response and next as we have been doing for middleware, but this time you're gonna to have to assign the interfaces and types to them. Go ahead and copy and paste this four more times and change these to actually match our CRUD function. So we're gonna have a read, we're gonna have actually a read all as well, an update and a delete. So let's start filling out our CRUD functionality. Inside of the create author, declare a const object. Inside of it, we're gonna retrieve the name and that's gonna be equal to request.body. Create a new author object and that's gonna be equal to a new author and inside of it, we're gonna have an object. First, you're gonna have an underscore ID. That's gonna be equal to a new mongoose.types.objectID as a function, and then comma that and pass in the name. Underneath this object, return an author.save. Make sure it's the lowercase author because this is a Mongo object now. Add a then and catch block. For the then block, we're gonna have the author prop point to a response.status of 201, pass in some JSON and just pass in the author that we just returned. And then for the catch block, you're gonna have an error prop and you can return a response.status of 500 here and then pass in the error inside of the JSON block. And you can see that when I save it periodically, it fixes the formatting for me with my prettier setup. Next, we're gonna to wanna to create our read functionality. So we're gonna to wanna to read a single author from the database and we're gonna get that author by the ID and we're gonna call a const author ID is equal to request.params.authorID. Now that author ID is actually going to be defined inside of our route when we declare the actual path. Next, we're gonna return an author.findById. We're gonna pass in our author ID and then add some then in catch blocks again. So here we're gonna have our author. Now, if it is found, so how we can check that is by calling author and then question mark to see if it exists. If it does, return a response of 200 and pass in that author. And if it doesn't exist, we can return a response of let's say 404 and pass in a message that simply says not found. 
Don't forget to add your error block by adding the catch block and call the error and pass in another response 500. What you can do is basically just copy and paste the one from above and your read author block is finished. Next, let's create our read all functionality. And let's just rename this to read all because we don't really need the author key here. This one's gonna be a little bit simpler because we don't need an author ID. I'm just gonna copy and paste the one from above and fix it up a little bit. Change the function to author.find and just return a response.status of 200. I don't have to return anything else and just change author to authors because that goes more in line of what we're looking for here since it's gonna be returning an array of objects. The update author, we're gonna to need to find that ID again. So you can go ahead and copy and paste getting the author ID from the read author. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna find this one by ID as well. So you can copy and paste th that part from read author as well, but the then block is gonna be a little bit different. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna actually have a function. Inside of it, you're gonna see if the author exists. Cool, we're gonna actually do some work on it by changing the variables. First, fill out the else block and just simply return the 404 not found. I'm gonna copy and paste mine from above. And inside of the if block, if it does exist, what you're gonna do is call an author.set, pass in the request.body as we're gonna pass in the name in the body. And then you're gonna actually copy the save block from above because now this Mongo uh, object or author object has been altered and just needs to be saved in the database. Now that we filled out this function, let's go ahead and round off this controller by filling out our delete author. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this one by ID as well. So go ahead and copy and paste that from above. Next, we're gonna call a return and it's gonna be an author.find by ID and delete, pass in our author ID. We're gonna add a then block and a catch block. Inside of this then block, I'm gonna copy and paste this from above. Uh, this time though, uh, if I find the author, I'm gonna change the status to a 201. And instead of returning the author, I'm actually just gonna have a message that says deleted. And I'm gonna keep the 404 not found just in case I can't find this author by ID. Go ahead and add your catch block. And then our delete functionality is finished. The last thing we have to do now is export all these functions so we can use them inside of our routes. Go ahead and export a default object. And inside of it, just pass in our five functions that we created. JavaScript is really nice because it just lets us type in the name once and then it automatically assumes that's both the key and value. Inside of the routes folder, go ahead and create an author.ts file. And now we're gonna hook up all these functions to our appropriate routes. We're gonna import express from express. We're gonna import our controller from our controller's author. Next, we're gonna call it const router is equal to express.router with a capital R as a function. Now we're gonna create our five routes. The first one is gonna be a router.post. I'm gonna have this route as forward slash create and call controller.createAuthor. Next is gonna be a get. I'm gonna go ahead and call get and then pass in the author ID and call the controller.readAuthor function. Next, I'm gonna call a router.get and just call get with a forward slash with nothing after it. Next, I'm gonna call a patch, and I'm gonna have the update slash author ID and call the update author function. And then finally, a router.delete with the forward slash delete, and as we've been doing, another author ID with the controller.delete author function. Finally, at the bottom, I'm going to export our router and save the file. Finally, let's go to our server.ts file, and what we're gonna do is at the top, first, we're gonna import our routes, so you can import and name it just author routes. You can call it really whatever you want from our routes.ts file. And then here you can do a router.use. First, I'm gonna call forward slash authors. And then secondly, my author routes here. So now that basically is saying that any of those routes, all I have to do is call forward slash authors, and then it will direct me to that routes file and then try and hook up with one of those functions there. And if it can't find anything there, then it's just gonna throw the error as we've seen before. So let's go ahead and call nodemon one more time and let's test this out. So I'm gonna call authors forward slash get and you're gonna see that it returns me an empty array because I don't have any authors yet. I'm gonna open a new tab here. I'm gonna make a post and I'm going to change this to create instead of get. Now you can see here I didn't put authors first so this isn't gonna work but let's go ahead and fill it out anyways. 
change your body type to JSON. And I'm going to put in a name. I'm just going to call this guy Gus person. You can name him whatever you want. This really doesn't matter. And when I send, it's not going to work because I didn't call my authors create. I just called create. So that's not a real route. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to authors create. And then you can see that it returns me the author object that was created inside the database and the corresponding Mongo ID that goes with it as well. So if I go back and I call the authors get like I did before, my authors list should now have this guy in it. So let's go ahead and call that. And you can see that he shows up. So next, let's play around with this a little bit more. I'm going to change this to a patch. And then I'm going to copy this ID and put it after my update. And I'm just going to change his name here to something else. And I'm going to hit send. And you're going to see that it changed his name. So if I go back and I call all the authors again, you can see that his name changes. Finally, if I change this to a delete and I change the router to a delete, you can see that he was deleted and he now no longer shows up inside of my call. So all of our functionality seems to be working pretty well. And let's just throw him back in the database and look at that, he shows up again. And you can see when I minimize, you can see all the logging just going crazy from logging all of our requests and it seems to be logging them properly. So let's go back to our models folder and create our book model. Just like before, we're going to be importing Mongoose from Mongoose and we're going to import document and schema as well. Export an interface called iBook and this is going to have a title and an author that are both strings. Then you're going to export an interface iBook model that inherits both iBook and the document from Mongoose. Go ahead and create our new model object. We're going to call it our const book schema. And inside of our new schema, we're going to have an object. That first object is going to have the title and that's going to be of type string and that's going to be required. And then the author of type schema dot types dot object ID. This is going to be required. And then you're going to have one more that says ref and that's going to be author, which references the author document collection. Here, we're going to have some options. Let's have the timestamps included with this one. And I don't think I have to set it, but let's set version key to true, I believe it is. And that will actually have that variable show up. I just wanna show you what it looks like. I think this might not be correct, but we'll just come back to it and see if it errors out. Finally, export a mongoose.model. You're gonna pass in your iBook model. And then inside of the function call, you're gonna call book with a capital B. And then you're gonna pass in the book schema. And this will declare our book schema for us. So now if you wanted to create the controller for this, you could very easily go to your author controller, copy and paste it, and just replace the variables for you. Uh, make sure you use capitalization, search for all the capital authors, search for all the lowercase authors, and you should be able to find and replace it pretty quickly. That being said, if you want an extremely fast way to do this over and over again, my recommendation would be to create a Visual Studio Code snippet. So I'm gonna show you how to do that right now, and then we're gonna use it to create our book controller and our book routes. Go ahead and create your book.ts controller. I'm going to go to my author controller and copy and paste the entire file. Next, I'm going to control shift P for my preferences. I'm going to search for snippet and then I'm going to click typescript.json or a new global snippets file. You can do either one, but let's just do the typescript.json now to be safe. Inside of it, we have to actually declare a snippet. So first let's give it a name. I'm going to call this one crud mongo. Inside of it, I'm going to have a prefix, which is what I type in to populate it. And I'm just going to call it crud mongo controller. Then we're going to have a body. This can be a type string or type string array. I'm going to pass in the array here. And now I'm going to get my code set up for editing. Create a new file and paste in your code that you copy and pasted. You can see at the top here, it's a new file. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to change all of our author variables into something that the Visual Studio Code snippets will recognize as variables that we want to change. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to search for all of the authors that start with a capital A. I'm going to hit Control F and make sure my case sensitive button is on there. It's that AA that's highlighted. I'm going to type in dollar sign and inside of some uh, parentheses, I'm going to type one colon model name. Next, I'm gonna search for all the lowercase ones and change this to a two dot variable name. I want them to be different.
You don't actually have to put a name into it, but I am. And then third, I'm going to change this, these two names, the variables that are being passed in to my start name. So how this is going to work is Visual Studio Code will highlight each of these variables in groups. So first it'll highlight the model name. So I'll be able to type in my model and then my lowercase variable name. And then finally it'll end with me typing in all of the things that I used to create my first document in the collection. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually minimize this a lot because I don't want word wrap to be on for this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use control alt and then the arrow keys on windows. This is going to be a different command on Mac and Linux. And what this does is extends your cursor to the line below it. So I don't want word wrap on, otherwise it's going to mess it up for some lines. And I'm going to start at the top on the beginning of the, of the first row and then go all the way down to the end of the file. And when you see the cursor lighting up the entire beginning of the file, go ahead and insert some quotes and it'll put it on the whole file. Then you're going to hit the end key and you'll see that the quotes, although they're not in a straight line anymore, are at the end of each line. Add your second quote and then add a comma at the end. And now this entire coding block has been changed to a giant string array very neatly and very quickly. So now that I have my string array ready to go, I'm going to copy and paste everything out of this file and it's going to go straight into my body array that I have in my TypeScript JSON. And then I'm going to hit save. And now I'm going to close the other file because I don't need it anymore. You don't really have to save that. And then I'm going to go to my book controller and test this out. So let's go ahead and type in our crud Mongo controller. And you, when I hit enter, you can see that first it wants me to edit the model name. So I'm going to hit backspace and type in book. Next, I'm going to hit tab and type in book with a lowercase. I'm going to hit tab one more time. And then I'm going to type in my title, comma, author, and then hit save for the auto formatting. And you can see that it has put everything in this file that I need. And just like that, my book controller is finished. So now let's do the exact same for routes as we did for controllers. Create a book.ts in your routes folder. Copy everything inside of the author.ts file. Go to your typescript.json snippet file, and let's go ahead and create a crud mongo routes definition. The prefix for this is going to be, you guessed it, crud mongo routes. And then we're gonna put the body array, and then we're gonna open up a new file and do the exact same thing that we did for our controller. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to find and replace the author with a capital A, and that's going to be my number one model name, just like I did before. And then I'm going to do lowercase and do the number two variable name that I did before. This one, we don't need a third one because these are the only two things we have to change. Then I'm gonna to go to the top of the file at the beginning, hit Control Alt, my down arrow key, put in my quotes, hit End, put in my quotes and my commas. Then I'm gonna copy and then paste this into my typescript.json file, just like I did before hit save, and then I can get rid of this file and then go to my new file that I created for my book routes and type in crudmongo crud routes and then start replacing my variable names here as I did for my controller. And just like that, I have everything ready to go for my books because there's nothing special about these routes. So this works just fine. I'm going to import my book routes inside of my server.ts file. And similarly, I'm going to define my routes below by using a forward slash books in my router.use function. Let's run nodemon one more time. And you can see that the version key did crash it. So I'm gonna go back and just erase that out of my Mongo model. I don't need it because it's already set to truthy. And now that I've done that, you can see that it starts up at the bottom. So let's go ahead and go to Postman and start playing around with this. You can see here when I run my books get, an empty array shows up. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a book. I'm going to call it, I don't know, Gus's book, call it whatever you want. And then for the author, I'm gonna pass in the author ID I have for uh, Mr. Gus dude down here. And you can see that the book is created and you can see that the version variable is there now. 
So you can play around with this and let's run a patch, change the name. And because we didn't change the route, it's actually gonna fail. So let's change this to update. First, let's grab our book ID. And then put it here in our books update path. And then you can see that it updated the book variable name. So this seems to be working pretty well as well. One more trick that we can do with Mongoose is actually select how our data is returned to us. So what we can do is when we're looking for the books, instead of returning just an author ID, we can actually have Mongoose populate that author ID into the author name. And we can also do things like remove certain fields. And that's why I wanted to actually leave the version key to show you how to get rid of it in another way if you wanna get rid of different variables. So I'll just use the version key as an example. Go ahead and go to the read book function here and add a little populate block and just select author so that it will populate the author by the author ID. And then you can go ahead and add that to the read all as well. And now if you wanted to actually get rid of a field, you can use the select block and inside of it, you pass in the field you wanna get rid of with a minus sign in front. That means to return not this field. Go ahead and add that to both the read book and read all blocks. And then we can run nodemon and run our call again and see what happens. You can see that now the author ID actually populates into an author object. And this works nicely wherever you're using interfaces from TypeScript because you're already gonna have those defined for you. So now that we have the heavy lifting of creating our controllers and our routes finished, our basic functionality is complete. So the next thing that we're gonna wanna do is validate any data coming in with our Joy data validation library. And what I mean by validate data is that any of the post patch or even delete in some cases, if you're passing in data requests, sometimes have a data payload. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is validate that data to make sure that it's the data you're expecting. So you don't want somebody inserting some malicious data into your database and then potentially compromising your security. Go ahead and go over to your middleware folder and create a new file called validate schema.ts. At the top, we're going to be importing Joy, and we're gonna also import the object schema from Joy. I also wanna import my next function response and request from Express. And then I wanna declare my middleware function. So we're gonna export const our validate schema. It's gonna take one argument, which is the schema of object schema, and then inside of it, we're going to return async and then pass in our express middleware. So we're going to define it as we did inside of the controllers by defining our request, response, and next function. Inside of this, we're going to add a try catch block. Inside of the try block, we're going to await schema.validate async. We're going to pass in our request.body. And then we're going to call the next function, assuming that this passes inside of the error block or the catch block, we're going to add our logging.error, and then we're going to return a response of 422 and just return the error in case this fails. Underneath the function, go ahead and export a const schemas, and this is going to hold all of our schema definitions. We're going to keep these schemas nice and simple. Let's start with our author schemas. We're going to need them in two spots for our post and our patch, where we post an object and update the object. So inside of our author object, go ahead and make a create object. And this is going to be of joy.object. And inside of the chevrons, we're going to pass in our iAuthor. Not the iAuthor model, because that's for the mongoose schema, but just the iAuthor. I'm using it here because I defined them separately on purpose so I could use them to help with my validation. Inside of the function call, open up another object and now start adding your keys. For the author, it's just the name, and that's going to be a joy string that's required. Nice and easy. I'm actually going to copy this and do the same thing for my update because I don't want to overcomplicate this at all. Therefore, I'm just going to have them send the entire object that they want to update, even if the keys are remaining the same. Now I'm going to do the same thing for my book. I'm going to create. And then for my author key, I'm going to have a string, but I'm going to use the regex block and I'm going to define this regex here. A Mongo ID is a mixture of alphanumeric characters. It's always 24 characters long. So this is how you enter the regex for that.
And then I'm going to add my title, which is also just going to be of joy string required. And you'll notice that my joy dot object here has my iBook passed into it. Don't forget to copy and paste this for our update key as well. Now that we've done that, we can start protecting our routes by going and altering our route files. Let's start off with the author. What we're going to do is we're going to be protecting our post and patch routes. So how we're going to do that is after our definition of the route, we're going to call validate schema. And then inside of the function, we're going to pass in our schemas dot author dot create, and then add a comma after copy and paste this, throw this in the patch route as well and change the author dot create to the author dot update. So now these routes need those specific keys to be defined the way they are in that joy schema file. Otherwise they won't work. And we can do the same thing here in our book routes by calling the validate schema again, but at this time calling our book.create and our book.update. And just like that, our routes should be protected now. So let's open up Nodemon and try this out. So let's make a post request, change this to Gus's book, and then go ahead and push it through. It's going to say not found, and that's because I had the update route here. So let's change that to create. And then you can see it creates properly for me at the bottom. So let's go ahead and get rid of half this Mongo ID and see if the regex stops it. And just like that, you can see that this post request doesn't match the requirements because the regex is wrong. So I'm not going to go through all the endpoints because it's all going to relatively work the same. So the last thing that we're going to do is take a look at how to create a build for our project. So very simply for our build, all I'm going to do is open up the terminal in git bash. And the reason that I'm using git bash is because I have that rmrf command. If you're using PowerShell or command prompt, please make sure you're removing the directories in the same way that they would do it. And then I'm going to run npm run build. And what you should see happen is that it attempts to remove a build folder if it's there and then run TSC, which is our TypeScript compiler. You should see a build folder show up on the left hand side here in your file explorer. To test to see if this is running properly, we can do an npm run start because it's going to try and run that server.js file. Let's just go to Nodemon real quick and make sure that everything is running smoothly. You see here when I run the ping, it returns pong, so everything is as it should be. So minus not running any tests, that's pretty much it from start to finish for getting a brand new project up and running. Now that you have Visual Studio Code snippets helping you out in whichever way you define your controllers, your routes, or any other files that you want to copy and paste easily, it should be relatively simple and straightforward to continue cloning these files into new controllers at a much greater rate than you would by typing them out by hand. Now, this is just for the Express Node framework for creating a RESTful API. There are frameworks out there that help you create APIs a little bit faster, but if this is the method that you prefer to create APIs, I hope that this was a good starting point for you and showed you everything that you need to know to create one of these in under an hour. That being said, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate everybody's support. Uh, and if you want to buy me a coffee, please do so. I'd appreciate it and it'll help me get you more videos faster. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning back in and we'll see you in the next one.